Hello and welcome, we're so excited for the launch of Strapi 5 and to jump start, we're going to talk about content editing experience. Today, we're going to have two presentations. Mark is going to talk about draft and published and what's new and Remy is going to tell us more about content history, a feature available in Strapi Enterprise and some of our cloud plans. But with that being said, let's jump in into the presentation, starting with Mark. We have introduced a major improvement to a draft and publish feature in Strapi. And before telling you how it works, let me show you how it worked in version four. So in B4, if you had a content type with draft and publish enabled, you could start by creating a draft. Uh, and that was meant so the draft was only visible on the Strapi admin side, but was not visible on your live data or your website, basically. So as soon as the content was ready, you could save, you could publish, and boom, it is live. The main limitation in version 4 was that if you now want to make an update, by pressing save, you are overwriting the published data that's displayed on your website. There's no possible way to make drafts in parallel of the existing published version that we just created. So the goal of the new draft and published version is just that, to allow users continue working on a piece of content even after it's published and not having to worry about making changes on your life's content. So this is what you will be seeing in B5. From now on, you will see two different tabs, draft and the published tab. The draft version, as mentioned before, is completely independent from the published version. So you can make edits on the draft version and the published version stays the same. So you can make the necessary updates and work on parallel on your draft. And once it's ready, you can save and publish and boom, now your content is ready. This is the main difference we have introduced on draft and publish, and this is why it was necessary to introduce it. But the admin panel is not the only change that we made on draft and publish. Let's go to the REST API and see what's different, because there's a couple of topics that we should mention on draft and publish. So if you want to get a list of entries, this is the same as always, get slash API slash articles. In this case, this could be the name of your content type you want to list. This returns the list of articles, but now we are returning a new attribute that's called document ID. And the main idea about this is in B4, we were using the entry ID to reference entries, and that was just not enough in B5. Entry IDs reference individual entries, but now the document ID will, re will reference all of the versions of a single entry. For example, the document ID will include the draft version, will include the published version, but also will include all of the locales related to that entry. That has a consequence, which is if you want to reference or you want to get a single article, you will have to use this document ID in your REST API. And by default, this will return the draft version and will return the default locale of your application. Normally it's English, but you can set up this in Strapi. We have introduced a new query parameter, which is called status. And here you can specify which version you want. If you want the draft version or if you want the published version. And at the same time, you can also specify the locate. And specifically, this was a major pain point for users because in B4, every locate had a different entry ID. But now in version 5, you will have a single document ID and you can reference which locate you want and also which status you want. And this is a summary of what changed on the admin panel and what changed on the REST API. There is a couple more changes that you can take on the documentation where you can see more examples, you can see more definitions. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. 
Hey everyone, I'm Remy from the Stripe team and I'm here to demo a new feature that we're adding to Stripe E5, which is content history. So first of all, content history is an enterprise edition feature. So you will need to either be a Stripe Cloud customer or an EE customer to use it. Now let's see how the feature works and how it can be useful to you. So to demo the feature, I have set up a Stripe application using a release candidate of Stratify. And I've set up a fairly simple content types. I just have brands on one side and tents on the other, because I'm looking into hiking gear at the moment. All right, so let's go into more details into one of these tents. And I can see my content. And on the overflow menu that you have on the top, I can click and there is a new option here for content history. So let's see what this looks like. Now content history is a special view where you're going to see one specific version on the main part of the screen. And then on the right sidebar, you can go back in time and view your content at different moments. So each version in this sidebar matches one moment when you either clicked save or publish in your content. Um, all right, so let's Make some changes. I'm going to add some more details. Need tracking polls, for example, so that people understand the product and I can save. And now if I go back to my history page, I have one more entry with this new paragraph. And if I check the previous versions, it's not there. Let's say that I think now that this is a bit too much in your face. And I thought that information wasn't really needed. I can go back to the version from seven minutes ago and click the restore button. And what that's going to do is simply go back to the content from when you saved that specific version. And now it's been saved and my additional paragraph is not here. Um, so that is the very base of the content history feature. Now let's go into a little bit more details. The content history is specific to each locale. So far, I've made a bunch of changes in the English version of my document. But if I go into the Spanish version, which doesn't exist yet, and I create it, let's say I add a verse description and I save. Now, if I go into the content history while being on the Spanish version of my document, I'm going to get the history only for Spanish. The two are completely isolated because generally you don't want to mix the content from one locale with the other. Now, another more important potential misconception is that content history, as the name implies, is about content. Uh, so it's about the data of your content and not the structure in your content. Generally, it's about everything that's going to happen in your content manager as opposed to what's going to happen in your content type builder. But we do handle content changes in the structure of your content. So let's look into how that works. If I go to my content type builder on the tent content type and I make some changes, let's say that I add another field, it's going to be a Boolean and it's going to be about whether the tent is free, strand st free stranding or not. And I'm going to make another change, which is that I'm going to, going to actually delete an existing field, which would be the specs JSON one. Now let's save this, go back into our content in the content manager, make some changes and see how content history adapts to the, the changes we just made. So if I go to the same tent, I'm going to make free stranding false. This is already correct. And let's say that I'm going to add another change at the same time, let's say 2024 in the title. I'm going to save. And if I go into the history, obviously the current version history matches what I see in the edit view. But if I go into an older version from before the changes in my content schema, I can see some interesting things going on. So let's focus first on the freestanding uh, attributes. So this is an attribute that we just added, but that did not exist when this, when this, con when this history version was created. 
So I get a warning saying, new field, this field simply didn't exist when this version was saved. And what this means is two things. First of all, it lets you know that this was not a field whose value was null or just empty when it was created, but it just straight up didn't exist, which can be useful to get more context regarding whether leaving that empty was a mistake or not. And the other thing, the important one, is the one about restoring, that if I restore this content, and that's what, what I'm going to do right now, this specific field will not be restored. So I'm going to restore this content, and we'll see what we end up with in, in the edit view. So let's see. I can see that I still have the freestanding value as false that I wanted before. So that was unchanged by restoring my content. But I can also see that 2024 is no longer in the name, which means that my content was indeed restored. Now let's look at the other change we made in the content type builder, which was deleting the specs attribute. You can see that this content now appears in a separate section of the page, which is called unknown fields. And this is basically to let you know that this is a field that existed when that specific version of the content was saved, but it no longer exists today. So it's just provided to you as a way to get more context and a deeper understanding of what the content was at a given time but it's extracted because it's important to know that it's not possible to restore it. So as you can see, or as you can guess, if I restore this specific content, I'm still not going to have a JSON field because it doesn't exist. Um, now this functionality, I think is pretty cool because what a lot of our competitors do is that they will either delete any trace of a field that doesn't exist anymore. So you would just have no idea that this used to exist. Or sometimes they will display it to you. But instead of showing you like the prop, they're just going to show you as a, like a JSON thing to copy, for example. Whereas here, this is a bad example, sorry, because I did use the JSON field. But for example, if you had a custom field here, we would have actually used the custom field component to show it to you it would just have been disabled, just like all of the others. You may be wondering how we handle relations in content history. So let me demo that part of the feature. So let's do this in the brand collection type. If I open up the first one, we can see that there is a one too many relation where one brand is linked to several tens. Now let's look into how this looks like in content history. And you can see, despite the little UI issues, because I'm demoing this on a release candidate, but you, you can get the gist of it. You can see that we're using the relation input to let you go directly to the edit view for each of the different entries that your content is linked to. Now, let's see what happens if I just remove one of the relations. Let's say I remove the solid version. I can save it and basically just removing a relation like this is just like many making any other change in a content. If I go back, I can see both relations and I can restore it. And now I have my two relations again in the added view. But the real challenge comes from what happens when the content is actually straight up deleted. So let's go to my solid tent and entirely delete the document. Now, let's see what happened on the brand side. As you may expect, the relation is no longer visible in the edit view. But what about history? Let's go and see. And you can see that in the last history version, we, had, we have still the link to the remaining tent. But it's also letting us know that there is one missing relation, that there is something that was here that no longer exists. Therefore, we cannot show it and we cannot restore it. But it's letting us know that there was something there so that we have a better understanding of our content and so that we know 
we have more context into what was going on, whether something was a mistake, or if something straight up never existed at all. Now this, it's a singular sentence because we only have one deleted tent, but if you have had six, it would let you know that there used to be six things, so it's a little bit more precise. And media assets work in exactly the same way as the relations that I just showed you. Now, let's take a moment to look into how the future was actually built, technically, which at its essence is pretty simple. First of all, we need to listen to all of the changes in your content. And the way we do that is that while the application is bootstrapping, we uh, registered a document middleware. Now, document middlewares are something new in Strapi 5. Um, it's a little bit similar to something you may be used to from before, uh, like lifecycle methods. Um, but this one is a little bit more programmatic and it lets us listen to all changes in any document. And then we have a callback function where we have all of the metadata on all of the information to act on those changes. And when we identify that this is a change, that's a change that we do want to record in history, then we create a new entry in our history version database table. And I'm going to show you how that was configured. The first big technical choice that we made was that we would have a single database table for the history of all your content types. And what enables us to do this is that, first of all, we have a set of, a set of properties that let us match one history version to one specific entry because we link to what content type it is, the document ID that it is, as well as the locale so that we can do the mapping and only retrieve the history for the right entry that we want. And also, instead of storing each field in its own column uh, in the database, we put everything into an object and we store that in a data uh, JSON field in the database. And this has been working pretty well for us. And it's what's letting us have this super flexible approach of one single database table. Now, the other interesting thing that we're storing is the schema. And this is actually what was, I think, the most challenging part of the feature, which was providing the functionality I demoed earlier, where we support showing you and rendering the fields even when they've been deleted in the content type builder. So let me show you, for example, what a history version item might look like in my database explorer. And if you remember the example from before, we had deleted the specs attribute. So now when we want to display a version and we find a specs here in the data and it's not, we know that it's not in the current schema, it's really easy to identify that this doesn't exist, but then you're left with this object and you don't really know how to display it. Is it Markdown? Is it a Boolean? Uh, you don't want to have to guess, basically. And so what we've done for that is that in addition to storing all of the data uh, in an object, we're also storing the schema for each individual version in an object. So with that, when crossed with, when crossing the schema and the data, we're able to know that specs was actually a JSON object. And therefore, we should use the JSON UI uh, and not, for example, the color picker UI. And that's what I think makes the feature pretty powerful. This is a little bit of a trade-off because it consumes more data. It's more storage. But know that if you are using Strapi Cloud, that data will not count in your quota. It's entirely provided by Strapi. All right, that is basically the gist of content history in V5. We hope you have a great time using the feature and we're really eager to hear your feedback on it. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by and we'll see you in the next video where we're going to talk about improved developer experience. See you all tomorrow.